This jack is a fruit. chimpa jack. A chimpa jack. And this is just an example of how we plant stuff here on Pahoy Hoy lava. Like if you can dig a hole, like get a drill or something, that's better. Like you really for your fruit trees, ideally you want like a four foot deep hole by four foot by four foot, right? But if you can't, if you can't afford it or whatnot, then you might as well just make mounds, right? So this was a pile of coconut husks and logs. We buried it with a cinder soil mix. So uh, we tell people black cinder is, an, is a need, not a want to grow food in Upper Puna, right? So um, it's really worth getting it. Um, so we around here, we do a 50-50 mix. If you're up uh, maybe above 1,000 a, a feet, maybe about 1,500, you start doing more like 70% black cinder and 30% soil. But so we just buried the pile of coconut husks and then planted this into it. And this was, this has grown so much since we planted it. And then put the coleus down, lay it, just lay the cuttings down, bury it with the mulch and they all pop through. And then that insulates it. Like we didn't water this during the drought because all of this growth keeps the sun and even the sweet potato keeps the sun from baking the moisture out. And then we've never weeded this ever. You know, this, this stuff is just keeping all the weeds down. Wow. So cool. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, pretty easy actually. And you know, we got the sunflower over there. We chop it. You know, we even, I stick the sunflower in right next to the tree. As long as you're not leaving for six months and you can regularly mulch it. Um, here's some sunflower here. So the thing, if you start getting into looking up Centropic Agroforestry, it's based around the fact that every time you trim a plant, it releases gibberellin, which is basically plant growth hormone. So this plant, since I'm cutting it off, right? Now it's releasing growth hormone in the ground and in the air, and that's making this plant grow faster. And every time you cut a plant, some of the roots die. So every time you trim your Mexican sunflower, the roots, some of them die off and turn into compost and feed this tree. So as long as I'm mulching this leaf matter in place, then every time you chop it, you get a surge of growth. Wow. So, and then on the flip side of that, if you see like some Mexican sunflower over there or there, it's flowering. When it starts flowering, it goes into what's called senescence. And that, and it's now it's not growing new leaves. It's putting all its energy into flower and seed growth. And then it's actually doing the opposite. It's sending like anti-growth hormone. It's like actually causing all the plants around it to slow down their growth, right? So when you have your Mexican sunflower or any mulch plant, you always want to cut it before it goes to seed. Like, like you see that one that's flowering right there. Mm -hmm. you, you really, like when the first flower appears, that's when you want to mulch it. Um, because once it's going to seed like that one, it's, it's like, you can see it's all scraggly. It's not full and rich leaves, you know? Mm -hmm. Versus that one over there where it doesn't have any and it's just an explosion. Right, you can see on the right, the right is the one I trimmed recently. So it's like dark leafy green. On the left there, it's all scraggly because mm -hmm. it, it's gone into senescence. Gotcha. So, you know, that's another thing with like what, if you're just using the local weeds that grow around here. Um, the ones that go to seed faster aren't quite as good as like, we really like glory bush because it takes, or wild azalea, because it takes more than six months for it to go to flower. So, you know, you can, it, you can just chop it and chop it and chop it and it never goes to seed versus like Coster's Curse goes to seed in maybe like three months. So not as ideal. What about pollinators attracting um, them? Yeah. So... Um, you know, we have a lot of flowering plants like this. Mm -hmm. um, Mexican sunflower is a great one. Mm -hmm. But our favorite is over here. Our favorite is the Chinese rainbows. Because this plant is a domesticated plant. It never goes to seed. So it flowers literally 365 days a year once it starts flowering. Um, so we, when we moved here, we didn't have like any carpenter bees. So we had to hand pollinate our lilikoi. And once we started planting these flowers everywhere, I mean, we have these everywhere. Um, now we have tons of carpenter bees, honey bees all year round. 
Um, I'd say the favorite food, if you're trying to attract carpenter bees, would be the sun hemp, and we'll show you that later. Uh, I guess the rattle pod. yeah, the rattle pod crotalaria is the scientific name. I guess uh, yellow is their favorite color of flower, so mm. yellow flowers are good. Um, you know, perennial peanut flowers are pretty good too. Nice, white delia. Right on. Yep. So well, I'm amazing. learning so much. <laughs> awesome. I wonder how much we can apply and at our elevation. All of it. I think just like I said, um, doing the 70% black cinder is going to be everything up there. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, if you just plant into local soil, it's just, even if you add the mulch and the dolomite and the fertilizer, you get so much water logging and it creates this anaerobic atmosphere. Mm. When it dries out, it turns into like a brick. Mm. And, you know, roots need oxygen. So if you're not getting the the air intake to the roots then stuff's just not going to grow e yeah, like even if it's our... heavily mulched even then i can show you this our, is our mix i mean we we like get cinder and soil and mix it together and you can see this is like 60 to 70 percent black cinder because the hamakua soil is so dense mm. that it's like once this gets rained down around the roots and then it compacts into like a clay then no oxygen no nutrients are getting to the soil or the roots anymore mm. versus as soon as you have this black cinder it's never going to compact as tightly as just the clay would you gotcha. know right so if you're if you're at like sea level to 500 feet we you maybe want like 30 percent black cinder and then maybe from because 500 it's... to 1500, somewhere around 50% black cinder. And then above 1500, maybe more like, you know, 70% black because cinder. Because of the moisture level. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like stuff exactly. that likes a lot of drainage here, we'll do like 70% black cinder and 30% soil because, you know, it's like it doesn't want to um, waterlog at all and we get so much rain that mm -hmm. you got to up the amount of black cinder versus the same planet sea level yeah. you know they don't get as much rain so you would so you can custom tailor the... to each plant you know mm -hmm. like a banana might like a little more mud versus you know a dragon fruit is gonna like a lot more cinder mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. but we kind of do it by the soil test is you do is you just do a do one of these and what you're looking for is that it does make a ball, but it's very easy to crumble, right? So that's kind of, that's that's what we look for is mm. like crumbly, but not, not too crumbly, but not too solid either. Mm -hmm. Versus like just the Hamakua soil. I mean, this has no crumble to it. Like this. So which is yeah, the like oxygen ball. can't even get through that, you know? Yeah. 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 Gotcha. So, and the other like... Public service announcement, do not use red cinder. Mm. Use black cinder for your plants. Red cinder inhibits plant growth, which is great for driveways, pathways, that kind of stuff, house pad. But for your plants, you mm. want to use black cinder. Why does it inhibit plant growth? It's the Why? amount of, uh, like, what makes it red is the aluminum and the iron in the soil, which is also acidic like the soil is a little bit more acidic so it's like we already the plants are already inundated with too much iron and aluminum so you don't need to add more to that in fact that's why we tell people you need to raise the ph by adding dolomite or ash coral things like that because basically like our soil and our rain it locks up all of those alkaline materials like calcium and phosphorus so you have to raise the ph so that way the plants it like unlocks the the nutrients from the soil so the plant can actually get to it mm. so it's like you don't need to add more aluminum and iron there's already plenty of it okay yeah i think basalt is like 10 percent iron or something like this literally you could stick a magnet on here and it would stick to the magnet wow you know? so we have there's no such thing as an iron deficiency yeah yeah okay right. wow. we're actually getting less soldier flies because we've been using county mulch yeah, instead so of wood chips if you want if you want to grow soldier flies from your humanure these bins have enough holes in them underneath or something that the black soldier flies can get in the key is to <laughs> use untreated wood chips for your your carbon source because the black soldier flies can somehow dig under them, even though the maggots can't, or the flies can't get to them. 
So this these would be teeming when 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 we use the wood chips. These would be teeming with black soldier flies. All you have to do is cut a hole out of the side, then use clear plastic tubing because they're attracted to light. Like when they're ready to to um, you know metamorphosize or whatever into their adult stage, they crawl towards the light. So you just need a clear plastic tubing out the side and then it drops into a bucket, right? With a lid on it and a hole in the top. And this, just your humanure could provide all the black soldier flies you need, you know? And, and maggots. Yeah, some maggots too, yeah. So as soon as we switched to the county mulch, we stopped getting the soldier flies because it like buried it too much. Like they couldn't get to it. So how would you get wood? Wood chips. Do you it's have to make it? Them from, you buy them from Tractor Supply. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I think they're untreated, one bag, right? bag, I mean, one. yeah, they're just like pine shavings. So shavings. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I have the, I know those. We that's get the it. more expensive one. They actually do a lot better. And it's like, they last just as long as the cheap ones. There's and a cedar one, too. Cedar was cedar not good. Cedar would inhibit the yeah. growth. Yeah, okay. it repels insects. And the, the pine's the, just cheaper. The soldier flies process the manure so well. <clears throat> That when I like dumped it out, there, <laughs> there was like no sign of manure anywhere. They didn't even smell. It was like they had already all eaten it all and processed it. And so it actually made the whole process way more like sanitary and less gross. And then this is, so this was a pile of, we used the county mulch. This is a pile and then of it's, mm -hmm. And then it's yeah. like layered Those. with the human manure compost. And Lasagna. see this stuff right here? This was mushroom fruiting bodies that poked up through this these holes and fruited. But, um, so you put the tarp on to keep the rain from drawing all of your nutrients out. And the cool thing was when we have, we don't currently, but when we had a compost thermometer on it, it stayed at 140 degrees for like a month, no turning. Mm -hmm. So every time you turn your compost, a bunch of carbon just evaporates. And so we're all about no turn compost. Yeah, sometimes just to aerate it, we'll just like stick the OO bar in there, move it around, and then just like poke holes in it. And this is hot still, like more than a month later. This, I mean, obviously the sun's hitting it, but this is hot. And you can see the mycelium right here. So yeah, yeah so like and smells. then what's, if you do this under a fruit tree that tree is gonna grow nice. so fast. Like even this breadfruit right here is catching some of this nutrients, but like, you know, you want you don't wanna burn the roots, but if we had moved it a little closer, then this would, we had a soursop grow like a, a foot every month for a while. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. it was crazy. And the, obviously the bananas you just ate. Also, we had three racks on the same bunch all of them over 50 pounds. That last one was 70 pounds. And it's like a point of pride when you have three were... big bananas and all three of them are fruiting. Like that takes so many nutrients for it to all go into fruiting like that. And let alone like they were all full. Yeah. Like bursting at the seams. Yeah, it's literally like... splitting. It's a testament. Yeah, yes, man. exactly. Yeah. Very proud. It's kind of invasive. So we're on the fence about sharing or telling people about it. What, but this... What's invasive? This, plant. this is like the spikiest plant you could imagine. It's like worse than the West Coast. And you, you can eat them? Yeah, Super good. They're so good. They're black, black raspberry. raspberries. Ooh. So high in antioxidants. Yours might be a little sour. They weren't maybe Grows good, like but... a weed. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's so good. I but want it. We can get you some, but that it's like you we all have a responsibility <laughs> to keep it from spreading, right? So it's like this is because this mean... could take over and be in every gulch. Right, so we're kind of, it doesn't... We're thinking about who we sell it to and where they plant it. Mm -hmm. Right, so the rain usually melts the, it like rots the fruit off. So that's the good thing is that it doesn't germinate from seed very well here, but it's still possible. Yeah, like if this was on the Kona side, this could, stuff, this could be an ecological disaster, you know? So, but at the same time, it goes with like the conversation about how invasive plants like Albizia, whatever it is, can save the world if we learn how to manage them you know mm. like you can green deserts you can build soil on pure lava rock like invasive plants can do amazing amazing things but it takes the education and the responsibility of using them correctly and this is a durian this is an example of if you plant a plant with no cinder this is three years old and it's probably only grown 
like this much in three years. And it's got tons of mulch on it, you know, tons of mulch. But without the black cinder for drainage, just, it wasn't even worth, you know, planting. I mean, no. the, nutri the nutrients can't even get to the roots because it's got clay up against the roots so tightly that the nutrients don't even have a chance to get to it. Right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, these are... These are so pokey, like even with leather gloves, it's like it terrible to, to chop it. Like it's not a fun job. So we only put it in places where you can, it's like an island, so you can get around <laughs> to it and keep it from spreading. Like I just right. came through a couple months ago and like took, like widened this corridor because it was going to go into the jungle. Mm -hmm. So right. I like pulled it out, ripped out all the spots because it bends over yeah. and then once roots. it hits the ground it roots just like any raspberry wow so it hops but you know the leaves are medicinal they help with like uh ibs or menstrual cramps so this is our this is our best bunch of bananas oh my um, gosh you know one thing wow on the, on the topic of bananas and like bunchy top virus one thing that people haven't really updated is that if you grow all of your bananas in one bunch it's like having all your eggs in one basket if one gets the virus, the whole patch is going down probably. So we always, we tell people, always plant your banana patches 20 feet apart at least. And then once you, once you get over three in a bunch, start digging them out and moving them, right? Like these, we've chopped these multiple times to keep growing back. But like there's these three main ones are the keepers. And then, you know, because we've seen half of our clients have bunchy top. They don't even know. And then it's all, they're all in one area. And then it's like, they're all doomed, you know? Mm -hmm. And we spend so much time trying to like save their bananas. And it's like, just space them out. Like if you space them out 20 feet, it can take six months for the virus to jump 20 feet. Like, but then not... there's sometimes where there'll be right, there'll be two bunches right next to each other. One has the disease, the other one doesn't. Like, it's just... It's so new that there's just not that much knowledge about it or how to deal with it. So, you know. Do you think having a high uh, immunity helps? Yeah. So, like, being like healthy? she said, a healthy plant is an invisible plant. So this one, you know, we had one with bungee top over there, but this one didn't get it because it was so happy and healthy that the mm -hmm. aphids the aphids can smell an unhealthy plant mm -hmm. and they'll like make a beeline for it but mm -hmm. we also picked non-moa variety because it's more resistant to bunchy top oh, like really? it's maybe not the tastiest out of all the bananas but it is one of the most resistant to bunchy top so we're like well yeah. just select for you know mm -hmm. plants that are gonna you know like uh what's the ones that are super susceptible silk fig is that i think it? any of the hawaiian varieties yeah but, you know, yeah, so you, this could get bunchy top. If we fed it enough manure, it would still produce racks. Yeah. But so that's cool. But at the same time, it could still be spreading it to all the other bananas. So we probably would just cut it down if it did have bunchy top. But mm -hmm. just as it just as an it's just nice, hardy, hardy plant. Dwarf namas are known for being resistant to hurricane force winds. Like whenever there's high winds, I just chop all the leaves off and I'm not even worried about them blowing over. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, the the large varieties can have, like, racks from, like, six foot tall, or five foot tall racks, like, right. they're huge. And, and namas can actually, if you have seeded wild bananas, namas can actually interbreed with those, and you can get namas with seeds in them, hmm. which is cool. So it's kind of like a semi-wild variety. Maybe that's why it's more... Uh, disease resistant disease, yeah yeah and then the other thing about bananas is the banana corn weevil which more people know about but it's like harder to diagnose because you have to dig it up look at the corn see if there's holes in it and then it's a lot of work to if it does have the weevil you gotta like chop most of the root ball off soak the corn in like hydrogen peroxide water overnight right so it's a bananas are a lot of work and it takes more fertilizer and mulch than any other plant like look this mulch pile is literally like four feet tall, you know? And yeah. like, so, you know, people are think like, I'm just going to plant my banana. It'll grow into a bunch of bananas and I just leave it alone and get fruit. But it's like, couldn't be more They're wrong. actually sort of a medium to advanced level. Like, and do dolomite. Good bananas. Dolomite's really important. They get, they get, they need so many minerals and nutrients. Like 
if you don't have dolomite, you're not going to get big racks. You're not going to get... Actually, let's talk about that. So um, we found out that the importance of pHing your soil with like ash, dolomite, lime, coral, whatever, is that because our soil is so high in aluminum and iron that... Um, I think mostly aluminum. Iron is actually worse in alkaline soils. It's the aluminum. Right. So because there's already so much of that present, when you add fertilizer, it will bind to the aluminum and iron in the soil before the plant gets to it. So if you pH, add dolomite with your fertilizer, then it's going to fill up the receptors in the soil, correct? So the plants actually get to it. Like it makes it more bioavailable, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to make the aluminum less bioavailable when the pH is corrected. It's going to make stuff like phosphorus more bioavailable. Um, it's actually how it works is that the the calcium and potassium ion have a positive charge. So if your soil is acidic, then it also has a positive charge and it's repelling those ions away. So they actually are just not like staying in your soil. They're not available in a mineral form. So So the dolomite adds the negative ion. Yeah. So it's a, it can actually bond and find replacement. Right. Yeah. So then it's not getting repelled. Then you have your calcium and potassium, which are in are really important. Magnesium are gonna stay in your soil and be available to the plant. So long story so, short <laughs> Add an alkaline thing when you fertilize your plants and your plant will be able to absorb more of the fertilizer. That's Such as now. dolomite. Mm -hmm. Such as dolomite or cal, what, what, cal mag. What do you one? think about seawater? Because it's mineral. Yeah, seawater is alkaline salt. because of all of those minerals. But, you know, it can burn your plants with salt. But, it, you know, if it's raining super heavy... I think, dilute it. Exactly. That's, that's what Jadam, you know. Yeah, no, that's actually really, oh, right. really true. Like, um, there's a lot of like pastures and stuff that are depleted of nutrients here. And, you know, seawater is free. That's a great way of, of adding minerals back to your plants. It's just dialing in the dosage, right? Like, obviously, a coconut can take way more than another plant but well, uh, what yeah the, what the hawaiians used to do like the ancient hawaiians would be to take coral and bring it up onto the land so that way because that's calcium so mm -hmm. the thing with coral is that it's so full of salt that we'll put it on our coconuts first because the coconuts can handle the salt and once it's rained out most of the salt then you can use it on your other plants without burning them with the salt but, I mean, you can br be bringing pieces of coral up from the beach, and that's going to help the land as well. And, you know, that's just what, like, the Hawaiians were traditionally doing, was bringing up coral from the, the sea and using it to get that calcium and the pH levels. Do you crush it up, or...? The more the better. The more surface area, the faster it's going to be absorbed. Right. But it's good to have a mix, you know? Yeah. If you have a bigger chunk, then it's going to slow release more. So, you know, mm. we'll, like, take a hammer, and you'll get some powder, but you also get the chunks, and that's just going to be more, like, slow release. Because gotcha. the, the bigger pieces will be there forever versus, you know, dolomite, you got to keep adding it because it's just getting washed through. Mm -hmm. We got the big pieces, then every time it rains, the rain is a pH of 5.5, which is pretty acidic. Right. So every time it hits that coral, it's going to be dissolving some of that calcium, potassium, magnesium. So it's like a slow release. So I th both is good, you know. Gotcha. We, use, we, we use big pieces, you know, especially on coconuts. Coconuts need extra potassium. They need extra chlorine. And they you need know. the salt. Like, coconuts actually need salt. So it's good to, like, bring salt water or even use sea salt and, like, sprinkle. Which seems counterintuitive to be, like, salting the earth, but... Yeah. Like, that's actually what coconuts want. Hmm. But there's also a lot of salt in pee, so... Oh, that's really? A, that's how we do it with oh, our cool. coconuts. Yeah, cool. We'll show you our dwarf coconut. It's only yeah. three years old. But so here's our dwarf coconut. And, you know, above a thousand feet, they grow a lot slower. But this thing is growing awesome because Daniel comes and pees on it all the time. Mm -hmm. This is Yeah, <laughs> this is three years old. We sprouted it from a seed nut. And it's growing in barely any soil. Like we mounted the, you know, the mulch with the soil on top, you but can it's see, like we use our coconut husks to make the mounds. Like you can see they're sticking out. Like we'll make the pile of coconuts and then add the um, cinder and soil sometimes. But it's like we just keep using it 
to like help build up the height for getting your mounds. And then, you know, it's breaking down and it'll aerate the soil. It's gonna become, it's gonna act just like those logs in our garden, you know? And then this is another one. We had it covered with sweet potato and then the pigs just like completely tore this mound apart mm. for the sweet potatoes, but. They don't yeah. mess with coconuts, huh? Well, they luckily the mounds the were like so far out that like they stopped before they got to the fruit tree roots. Like they nice. were mostly just interested in the worms and the, um, the potatoes. So mm. thank God they stopped before them. But yeah, that's another coconut. One one thing um, I was talking to earlier about nitrogen fixers is that, you know, um, most people, including me a few years ago, you plant it next to your fruit tree thinking this is going to be giving my tree nitrogen, right? It's actually not true. This is actually competing with nitrogen with the coconut. So even though it's fixing its own, it's still competing and absorbing nitrogen. So the real magic for the nitrogen fixers is when you chop and drop them then all of this nitrogen goes back and then you get the growth hormone and stuff. But until you chop it, then you're, you know, it's not doing that much. And then especially when you're talking about senescence and stuff, the real nitrogen draw is when this goes to seed, that's then it's really taking all of the nitrogen from the root nodules, putting them into the seeds. So that's why you want to chop it when it starts going to flower or before, before it starts drawing that, out of the soil. Gotcha. This is a mound that was not here a year ago. We actually got married on our property. This was our wedding mill. We built this for, this is where we got married. <laughs> this is a giant pile so cool. of Albizia logs, like big, big Albizia logs. Yeah, so we did Albizia logs filled in with cinder as we oh. were building up. So let me get this right. Before this was here, you mm -hmm. got married and then no, you no. put, we yeah. got married on, we got married right here on top of it. <laughs> like we were standing right, right we, here and right there. We planted the coconut for like our unity ceremony yeah. instead of like adding sand or whatever, something like lame keepsake that you have to like put on a shelf somewhere. We decided to just plant our coconut. Wow. So like that's our like wedding unity <laughs> ceremony thing was like, so we stood there and then at the end we planted the coconut. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, this wow. it's like, you can see where the coconuts husks start, like that, that's the floor. And this has now become like a dwarf coconut planter. Wow. And the cool thing is this is, there's Mexican sunflower around this whole thing. I just cut it, but like all oh, of, a lot of this mulch was grown just in this circle around here you know even you can see uh sugar cane leaves uh this uh pigeon pea i keep cutting so it's like uh yeah it's kind of uh, the the guild coconut system coconuts. where everything this coconut needs to grow is just grown right around it love it you guys gotta do another ceremony on the next property yeah dude yeah. once we decided to move i was like why did we do all this work to marry our own property like, we're <laughs> leaving this is the top of the very first white pineapple we ever ate this, oh this is from the from this the top is, this yep. is we bought a pineapple we it was our first white pineapple we ate and then we planted the top and that's wow. this it's stoked yeah we, we got a huge pineapple off of it last year nice. like this thing yeah yeah this is our very first white pineapple that we ate. Um, you can see we got the perennial peanut we you know we like perennial peanut we don't rely on it a ton but uh it's good and this is this is the crotillaria aka sun hemp and you can see there's a carpenter bee over there this is their favorite so if you want to grow lilikoi and you're looking for like how do i bring in the pollinators just make sure you grow this near your lilikoi or they'll ignore it just to go for this right mm -hmm. but you can show them the seeds this is a i don't know if there's any the the root nodules on this are so plentiful it might fix more nitrogen than like almost any nitrogen fixer you can see the carpenter bee so we didn't have any carpenter bees three years ago and then obviously they love the chinese rain bells as well and then this is like super easy to break up by hand you don't need special tools so um you can just throw the seeds out especially when you break ground you just got bare root the soil like at your place you can just be throwing thousands of seeds you can get them off the side of the road easy they grow everywhere 
And this is a similar kind of flower as um, perennial peanut. Like if something has a yellow flower like this, it's a good chance it's a nitrogen fixer. Pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Does it do from cutting? I Yeah, I have gotten to, to go from cuttings. Okay, yeah. cool. But the seeds... You know, there, there's different kinds. The one I the one I gave you has like not as many seeds. This kind will have like a hundred seeds per pod, and so and you just throw them. I yeah. you break it with your hand a little and then just chuck them. Cool. Now you can see they're. It's good to put it in agitated soil though. It won't right. Yeah. Really plant sure. I, ha I have soil. I have chickens, so maybe that helps to kind of because they scratch them up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They might even eat them. Yeah. This is a different kind. This is like more of a shrubby kind. Yeah. You see this in like Volcano Park oh, at the lower yeah, part or yes, like yes, yes, yes. Calapana. For sure. Here's the fatty rack you were seeing. Yeah. How so about you guys stand next to it, huh? Sure. That's a that's a testament, man. This is the that's other one monstrous. you were just eating was way bigger than this. No way. Way fatter too. Oh yeah, it was like yeah, this, this one big. this one could be fatter, honestly. But so, not bad. The, so the ducks just poop on it. It's in the pen. So we've never fertilized this. This it just has duck poop in place, and wow. we also planted it on a next to an ohia stump, so it's kind of getting those nutrients. Cool. And this is a koa ia. This is the lowland koa native to Kauai. Oh, wow. So uh, it might do a little better with the uh, the koa rot. Not sure yet, but uh, it's nice. It's pretty. It's small. So this is our duck pen. We planted a food forest in here because it was like all the manure is here, all the nutrients are here. So why lug manure halfway across your lot when you could just plant your food forest into it? So like, like you can see the mound, like this is where the coke, oh yeah, you can see the duck eggs. This is where the ducks love to sleep and like make their nests at night. Yeah, so yeah, if you make, so just figure out where your ducks are spending the night in your pen and then plant the banana right there. Yeah. And then they'll just, like, we didn't even have mulch on this for a while, and it was growing so fast just from the pure duck poop, right? It, it would be like a landslide of duck poop coming right. down it. It was insane. So, so this was, <laughs> this was like a pile of, of um, aged guava, and then just buried it with the county mulch. And now it's just pure compost. Like we could dig this up and put on our plants because the ducks down, poop on it and it just wow. filters through. And we've put down like thick layers of um, guinea grass, like yeah, sugar four cane. or five times, like yep. thick layer. And it's just, it's gone. It just disappears. So cool. You know? So this was a natural low spot that we dug out with the old bar. This and is normally full of water. Yeah, it's like a little Like where Daniel's right at now. is like the middle of the pond yeah, It goes usually. up to here. But so again, this is a nutrient sink. All of this poop here, every time it rains, it goes right into here. And then we, you know, like the guy on your channel called it duck sauce. We just, I just use a bucket and I pour it on all the trees. And be, all the trees closest to it get the most. Like this guava gets more than any because it's so super easy to just mm -hmm. scoop it out, dump it on there. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you can see we've got a Cuban red. Happy. Awesome. So good. Yeah, you can see I Another just coconut. I just piled a bunch of of the mud when I when I dug out that pond. This was all the mud. It, so it's like a good mud poop mixture mulch. You know? Nice. And these Amazing. these cacao are growing super duper fast. Got the Ruby X Supreme guava. That's the white Indonesian guava. Nice. Here's another favorite duck <laughs> nesting spot. Little egg laying nest there. Yeah, so we have enough space that they don't really debark any of the trees. Right. And if they're like not getting along with the other ducks, they can go in the back. Like they have enough space to get away from each right. other. Sure. And you can see this banana is about to flower. It's tapped into this, this mulch compost floor. It's, it's got its roots in it and it's been growing super fast. And like, I've never fertilized it. It's just tapping into the, all the duck poop that's naturally occurring around it. So this is a totally effortless banana. I probably planted it like a year ago. Wow. And it's got, what, five pickies, four pickies? I mean, he planted like most of these about a year ago. Like this is a mulberry. This is that jaguar cacao, the white bean one. It's 
huge. I mean, these take more like four to six years of fruit. They take longer than a regular cacao, but it's like... This one's growing so fast. It we, could we, fruit in the same amount of time as a regular because it's getting so much nutrition mm. here. And, you know, the ice cream bean was shading it. And unfortunately, I cut it right before the drought, so it is getting a little fried. But you know, for the these cacao, this was a this was an experiment on high density planting. So what do you do if you don't have very much room? You plant your trees like literally three to five feet apart, and then you just prune them to be smaller, right? Mm -hmm. So like, that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, and this cacao is enjoying the shade of this banana. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> is it awesome? That's good. Nice. And the mulberries are are pretty shade tolerant. You know, the the guavas are a little shade tolerant. You got a low clot. So this was kind of an experiment of like how many tr fruit trees can you fit in a small amount of space? Mm -hmm. And because of the uh, sheer amount of the of nutrition from the duck poop, it's working really well. Oh sweet! Here's some rattle pods. Yeah, this is the this is our favorite kind of area. Oh, they don't they didn't rattle. Can I take some seeds? Oh, yeah. I'll take all of them, man. And so, <laughs> which one of you? We kind of were. I was kind of experimenting, like, what's better, Mexican sunflower or crotalaria? Mm -hmm. um, in this case, for this experiment, the crotalaria won because obviously it's fixing nitrogen on like the sunflower. This this is a tropical peach, go. or tropical prince peach. <laughs> this is like. I, d I don't know how big it was when I planted it. It's a peach? Yeah, and it can fruit with no chill peach. Wow. It's it's the fastest growing tree on our on our property, and I think the crotal area is a big reason why. Just, wow. Like, so this, I should have chopped it before it went to seed, but in this case, I wanted to keep spreading the seed. But last time I cut it right when it was flowering and then mulched it in place, and boom, this thing just exploded. Cool. So watch your head. Please. This was our original duck pen. This is cool. Er, duck pond. Yeah, so you can see we the the level of rock used to be more like the here. So we chipped all that out, and like I said, because it's the water sitting in it, it gets really soft. Mm. Not not super soft, but soft enough that you can get in there with the oil bar. So every time it dries out, we muck out all of the gross poopy soil, mm. and then we start chipping away at it. You see that stump right there? You can burn your stumps. And, and, and that biochar, biochar is like one of the best soil components ever. Like, because, you know, you can, mul you can make mulch. Half of the carbon is turning into CO2. Like the, the fungus breathes CO2 like us. So mulch isn't like a permanent thing. Or if you till your soil, you know, or you turn your compost pile, boom, there goes a bunch of CO2. When you make biochar, that carbon is locked in mm -hmm. for thousands of years. So the well, Terra has... Preta from the Amazon, basically you mix biochar with humanure and you have soil that's going to be fertile for thousands of years. So cool. Well, and the totally. biochar has a positive ion, right? So it needs to bond. It's negative. Yeah. It's alkaline. It's a negative ion, so it needs to bond with something. So if you put charcoal just straight into the soil, it's going to be absorbing from everything around it first because it's trying to get that... Um, positive ion bond to bond with but if you just soak it in pea humanure or humanure or compost tea like even if you just made like a com a comfrey slurry and just set it in there like it's gonna bond with those nutrients and sl be slow releasing for I thousands mean, of years thousands of years like yeah. they're still they are still amazed by the soil composition in the Amazon because if, and they just figured out it was the biochar with the humanure that wow. has made the soil composition of the Amazon like so awesome. Parts of the Amazon. So cool. Yeah, where it was cultivated by humans. Because normal Amazonian soil, just like here, it's to super depleted from the rain, it's mm -hmm. acidic. Mm -hmm. But then when you have the terra preta, the biochar humanure soil, it's like, it's renewable. Like you can farm it and it keeps being good soil mm. and it and they even there's some sort of strange fungal activity they don't know what's happening but it's like the the mycelium is like supercharged by it mm -hmm. Mm. hey thanks for coming and seeing our property and uh hanging out with us if you're interested we are putting our property up for sale so you can email us
and we do consultations, design landscape, and we'll do the hard work and do the installation. Um, Daniel's a good fruit tree pruner and we have nursery plants for sale. So we try to be your one-stop shop for food foresting. So email us at foodforestfolks at gmail.com. Right on. Thank you guys. Thank Thanks, you. Man.